Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Have you ever met a couple of people that just play off of each other? I mean, they get each other going. Maybe it's their sense of humor. They just go back and forth, and each iteration of joke seems to get worse than the last. Well, this is kind of how resonance works. In the last video, I talked about the basics of impedance. I presented phasers and the magnitude and phase of impedance and series and parallel impedances. Well, I'm going to be building on those foundational thoughts as we consider the whole business of resonance. Now, if you missed that one, I've put a link up in the corner here for you so you can take that in. You will find a link to the octave file simulating both series and parallel resonance circuits with both ideal and real world components in the description. More on this later. Lastly, I've also provided a link in the description below to a math sheet for those who want to dive into the math. I'm purposely not going to wade too deeply into the math here. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So let's start with a basic understanding of how we define resonance. We probably think of resonance most often when we think of antennas. But with this said, I'm not going to be addressing antennas in specific in this video. I am going to be talking about the interaction of inductance and capacitance to create resonance circuits. Without resonance, there would be no radio communications. And this exists all through our radio equipment and is totally essential for things to work as they should. There are two basic kinds of resonant LC circuits. There is the series resonant circuit and there is the parallel resonant circuit. As I address each of these two possibilities, I will start with the ideal situation. We have perfect ideal components. Well, I have to answer the very basic question right out of the gate. What makes a circuit a resonant circuit? Everything that follows hinges on the answer to this question. When we are talking ideal, perfect components, resonance occurs when the magnitude of the inductive reactance is equal to the magnitude of the capacitive reactance. While their magnitudes are the same, they are by definition opposite in polarity. So we have the inductive reactance is equal to minus the capacitive reactance. When this occurs, the effect of the inductor and the effect of the capacitor cancel each other out. It's like, well, they no longer exist. The effect that this has on the circuit in question depends a lot on whether the capacitor and inductor are in series or in parallel with each other. Now, so that we're all on the same page, I just want to remind you that the impedance of an ideal capacitor is simply its capacitive reactance. There's no resistive part because we're assuming perfect conductors and perfect connections. None of the pieces and parts have any inductance associated with them. It's just a pure, unadulterated, perfect capacitor. Thus, the impedance of the ideal capacitor would be zero minus one divided by two times pi times f times c, that quantity times j. In a similar manner, the impedance of the ideal inductor is simply its inductive reactance. There's no resistive part because we're assuming perfect conductors which are happy to pass current without encumbrance. We are also assuming that there is no capacitance between the windings of the inductor or any of the pieces and parts associated with it. We just have the pure, unadulterated, perfect inductor. Thus, the impedance of this perfect inductor is equal to zero plus two times pi times f times l times j. And this is what we're going to be dealing with. I will begin by showing you how this plays out with a series combination of an ideal capacitor and an ideal inductor. When we talk about impedances in series, the total impedance is simply the sum of the impedances. So 
Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 and so on equals the total impedance. Now, if the inductive reactance is equal to negative capacitive reactance, then we can represent both the magnitude of the inductive reactance and capacitive reactance with X. So the impedance of our perfect inductor becomes zero plus X times J, and the impedance of our capacitor becomes zero minus X times J. And that would give us a total impedance of the inductive reactance, zero plus XJ, plus the imped impedance of the capacitor, which would be zero minus XJ, so that we would end up with zero plus zero plus X minus X times J, a total impedance of zero plus zero J. We have ourselves a dead short. So a series resonance circuit with an ideal capacitor and an ideal inductor becomes a dead short at the frequency where the magnitude of the inductive reactance is equal to the magnitude of the capacitive reactance. This frequency may be calculated using this formula. 1 over 2 pi times the quantity of the square root of 1 divided by the inductance times the capacitance. So what happens to the impedance of the circuit as we approach the frequency of resonance? Well, to answer this simply, let's first consider a circuit with two resistors in series. If one of the two resistors has a larger value than the other, which one dominates the total resistance of the circuit? The larger valued resistor, of course. The larger the difference in the values of the two resistors, the more influence the larger one has. Now, consider the LC resonance circuit. There are two things going on here. First, the reactive values cancel each other out at resonance. Second, the one with the largest value ends up being the dominant one when we are away from the resonant frequency. So we ask, which component has the larger impedance value at lower frequencies? Inductive reactance increases as we increase frequency. Capacitive reactance decreases with increasing frequency. At resonance, the inductive reactance equals the capacitive reactance. Thus, below the resonant frequency, the capacitive reactance will be larger than the inductive reactance and will dominate the impedance of the circuit. So as we increase our frequency from some low value approaching the resonant frequency, the series resonance circuit will be capacitive. Conversely, as we leave the resonant frequency heading up in frequency, the inductive reactance will be larger, so the series resonance circuit will be inductive. So what about a resonance circuit where the ideal capacitor and ideal inductor are in parallel? As I already said when talking about the series resonance circuit, resonance occurs when the magnitude of the capacitive reactance equals the magnitude of the inductive reactance. Well, the same is true of the parallel resonance circuit. As a little reminder of what I said in my video on impedance basics, when we're talking about parallel resistors, it is easier to think of adding their conductances together and then converting the resulting conductance back to resistance. And as you might recall, the conductance of a resistor is equal to one divided by the resistance. If the two resistors have the same resistance value, then they also have the same conductance value. Well, the same is true of a purely reactive component, such as the ideal capacitor or the ideal inductor. The difference is that we are adding the susceptance of each component. The susceptance of a reactive component, such as an inductor or capacitor, is equal to one 
divided by the reactance of the component. As with resistors, if the magnitude of the capacitive reactance is the same as the magnitude of the inductive reactance, then the magnitudes of their susceptances are also equal. The difference is that the sign of the susceptances are opposite. The sign of the capacitive susceptance is positive and the sign of inductive susceptance is negative. Yes, the sign of susceptance is opposite that of reactance. When we put an ideal inductor in parallel with an ideal capacitor, we add their respective susceptances to get the total susceptance. If they have the same magnitude, but the opposite sign, then the resulting sum of the two values is going to be zero, just like when we added the two impedances together with the series resonance circuit. What we have here is that with a perfect ideal inductor and a perfect ideal capacitor in parallel, the total susceptance of the circuit will be zero at the resonant frequency. But we're not quite done yet because we want to convert this susceptance back to reactance. And we do this by dividing it into one. Well, what do we get when we divide anything by zero? Well, we get infinity, a number so big that it cannot be calculated. So if we have an ideal capacitor, in parallel with an ideal inductor, the frequency is such that the magnitude of their respective reactances are equal, then the presented impedance will be infinite. Now, what happens on either side of the resonant frequency? Well, to understand this, we're going to have to go back to resistors in parallel. If we have two resistors in parallel, and one of the resistors is larger in value than the other, which one affects the overall value of the combination of resistors more? The larger value or the smaller value? Well, the answer is the one with the lowest value. The total resistance is always smaller than the smallest value resistor in parallel. Now we think about the capacitor and the inductor. Now, what's happening with the reactants as we change frequency? The lower the frequency, the smaller the value of the inductive reactants. The lower the frequency, the larger the value of the capacitive reactants. In a parallel resonance circuit, the overall impedance will be inductive when we're below the resonant frequency because the inductive reactance has a lower value than the capacitive reactants at the same frequency. Now, as we approach that resonant frequency, the difference between these two values grows less and less. The susceptance approaches zero, which means the impedance increases in a positive direction until it reaches infinity. Just as we pass the resonant frequency, the capacitive reactance is less than the inductive reactance. The impedance immediately changes polarity from positive to negative. The impedance is now very, very large negative value. We are now capacitive and will remain capacitive as we continue to increase frequency. But we don't have ideal components. There's no such thing as a capacitor, which is all just pure capacitance or an inductor that is unencumbered by resistance and capacitance. Well, what do we do with these things? How do these non-ideal characteristics affect our resonance circuit? Well, you know, conductors all by themselves have resistance. It doesn't matter if they're in the form of a wire or if they comprise the conducting plate of a capacitor. And there's no such thing as a perfect connection. There's always going to be some finite resistance associated with every connection. Further, conductors have of themselves the intrinsic property of inductance. Every conductor has inductance to one degree or another. You just can't fight physics. Beyond this, if two conductors are in proximity to each other with some sort of insulator in between them, we have a capacitor. Stray capacitances everywhere, even within our components. So what does this model look like for a capacitor?
we have here, as you can see in our model, a series resistance. This is the equivalent series resistance, or ESR. We also have a series inductor, which is the equivalent series inductance, or ESL, of the capacitor. Then there is a resistor in parallel with our ideal capacitor, which represents the leakage current of the capacitor. This parallel resistor is what is responsible for the capacitor slowly discharging over time. Now what makes this even harder to nail down is that these non-ideal aspects of real-world capacitors are not static entities with regard to frequency. All of these non-ideal characteristics of the capacitor contribute to the capacitor's self-resonance. Self-resonance is where the series inductance of the capacitor and the ideal capacitor come to a point where they form a series resonance circuit. As we increase frequency, we come to a point where this capacitor will become an inductor. As you can see here in my V&A sweep of this 82 picofarad capacitor on this Smith chart display, we can see the line all down here in the lower hemisphere. This is where the capacitor is, well, a capacitor. But let's follow this line around, and eventually it crosses the central meridian into the upper hemisphere. This place where it crosses that central meridian is the self-resonant frequency, and beyond that, it is turned into an inductor. With this capacitor, this occurs at a frequency around 140 megahertz. And by the time I reach 300 megahertz, it looks like a 7 nanohenry inductor. Now, how about that real-world inductor? Now let's think about a real-world inductor. This model is a bit simpler. We have the series resistance, which is the DC resistance of the inductor. Now this includes the wire which makes up the inductor and the leads of the inductor. We have a capacitor in parallel with the ideal inductor, which represents the interwinding capacitance of the inductor. We have, by definition, conductors set next to each other with insulation in between. This interwinding capacitance and the intrinsic ideal inductor work to present a parallel resonance circuit. As we increase frequency, the inductor will reach a point of self-resonance and go from being an inductor to being a capacitor. As you can see in this case of the V&A sweep of an inductor using the Smith chart display, here is a line along the upper hemisphere of the chart. This is where the inductor is acting like, well, an inductor. But watch as we follow this line around as frequency increases. It approaches and passes the central meridian into the lower hemisphere of the Smith chart. This is where it begins acting like a capacitor. This point where it crosses that central meridian occurs at around 130 megahertz for this inductor. By the time we reach 300 megahertz, it looks like a 0.5 picofarad capacitor. Now we can put all of these realities together into models which attempt to take these non-ideal characteristics into account in our calculations. And probably to your relief, I'm not going to go through all the math associated with this here. I will provide, however, an octophile for you which will have all of this in it should you be interested in it. You may ask, well, what is Octave? It is an open source GNU clone of MATLAB. I plan on having a video on this wonderful free application sometimes. Regardless of whether we're talking about series or parallel resonance, Perfect resonance occurs when the sum of the impedance represented by the inductor and the impedance presented by the capacitor is zero. Notice that I said impedance as opposed to reactance. This is because these real-world components are no longer perfect. I also want to note that it is unlikely that you will ever totally, completely match impedances between two real-world components. Furthermore, 
whatever circuit you might place the resonant circuit into will also present its own influence over the precise resonant frequency and overall performance of the circuit, so we cannot expect reality to perfectly match calculation no matter how carefully we do the math, but we can get reasonably close. Well, let's first take a look at the effects of the non-ideal on a series resonant circuit. Here I have a 1.8 microhenry inductor and an 82 picofarad capacitor in series, as you can see. The nominal resonant frequency is around 13 megahertz. I am scanning this with my nano VNA, and I've displayed the Smith chart and the imaginary or reactive portion of the impedance. Looking at the Smith chart, we can see two places where the trace crosses the central meridian. These two points represent two separate resonant frequencies. The first occurs in the vicinity of 13 megahertz. It is the primary resonant frequency attributable mostly to the values of the capacitor and inductor. The second crossing is due to the self-resonance of the inductor. So how do we know it's the inductor? It is because the self-resonance of an inductor acts like a parallel resonant circuit which starts out looking like an inductor and ends up looking like a capacitor and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Now let's turn our attention to a real-life parallel resonant circuit. I'm using the same components as before so I expect a resonant frequency of around 13 megahertz. Like the series resonant circuit, we see two places where the impedance crosses a central meridian of the Smith chart. These represent two separate resonant frequencies. The first occurs around 13 megahertz, where we expect it to. This is the primary resonant frequency. We can see this very quick swap on the impedance chart from the very positive to the very negative values. The second crossing is in the vicinity of 150 megahertz. This is mainly due to the self-resonance of the capacitor. And you say, well, how do I know this? It is because the self-resonance of a capacitor is a series resonant effect, which glides across the zero impedance line as the frequency increases, moving from being capacitive to being inductive, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Well, at this point, you should have a pretty good idea of what resonance is and the effects that the parasitic aspects of real-world components have on the performance of both series and parallel resonance circuits. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!